Good day, friends. I'm Kerry Dillinger. This is Bible Class Topics. We have a topical study for you today, and it's entitled Christian Disappointments. Specifically, we want to talk about disappointments that new Christians face. Let's get our Bibles out. Let's turn to 3 John. We're going to look at verse 3 and 4, and then we'll have a few more things to say in our introductory remarks. And then we'll get into the lesson proper. The Apostle John wrote in 3 John, verses 3 and 4, For I rejoiced greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Their great joys in seeing Christians grow in the faith, as we just read in the third letter of John. And also, you can take a look at the second letter of John, verse 4, when he says something very similar to those readers. Unfortunately, not all Christians grow as they should, especially new Christians. Problems and disappointments can overwhelm them, and some will fall away. This should concern us because Christians are responsible to those who are young in the faith. Listen to Paul in Romans 15 verses 1 and 2. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let us each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. He wrote to the Galatians. In chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Today's lesson is intended to help us understand and deal with some disappointments that the new Christians face in their spiritual lives, and of course, in their daily lives as well. Because once we become Christians, those two lives, our daily lives and our spiritual lives, are inextricably linked. Let's start with disappointment in themselves. That's a dis- those are disappointments that new Christians often face. Do you remember when you became a Christian? It was a time of great excitement. We think about some of the conversions in, in the book of Acts, and we see that there is some excitement involved. We think about Lydia and her family. We think about the Philippian jailer and his family. We think about Cornelius and his family. But for straight-up excitement, I think we can see it best in the case of the Ethiopian eunuch and his conversion in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. And when Philip and the eunuch came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. When we first become Christians, we enjoy the forgiveness of sins, the chance to start over, and the new relationship with our Savior. But we discovered that temptations are as strong as before, and sometimes they're even stronger as the devil tries to snatch us out of the hand of God. This easily discourages many new Christians. Jesus, in Luke chapter 8, verse 13, is discussing the parable of the sower. The seeds are sown, and the different ground has accepted the seed or rejected the seed. And he says the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy. But because they have no root, they believe for a while and in the time of testing, fall away. How can we help? 
How can we help our new brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, first of all, we need to remind them that change is ongoing. That takes us to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In his letter to the Colossians in chapter 3, let's take a rather lengthy reading of verses 5 through 11. Paul, once again, is the writer of this letter. And he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, that is in the church, there is no Greek, or Jew, or circumcised, or uncircumcised, or barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all, and Christ is in all. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind means constantly changing one's thinking morally and spiritually as to cause a change in one's actions and become closer and closer in alignment with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We need to remind our new brothers and sisters that this change is an ongoing process. Remind them and teach them of God's willingness to forgive. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then moving forward to chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, namely Jesus Christ the righteous. The Apostle Paul weighs in in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Finally, we can help our new brothers and sisters in Christ set aside the disappointments they may have in their own lives by laying aside the sins which constrain us. The Hebrew writer in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. All of these things will be helpful to the young Christian as they begin their life with Jesus Christ. The young Christian is liable to be disappointed with the other Christians. There might be disappointment in the brethren that they meet. They, they see and witness inconsistency in the lives of other Christians. They see those who don't practice what they preach. It hurts when they see a lack of faith in those they respect. Unfortunately, this is not a new problem in the church. The Apostle Peter himself caused much disappointment with his own personal lack of consistency 
as we can read about in Galatians 2, verses 11 through 14. But when Peter, that is Cephas, came to Antioch, Paul said, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Nobody is perfect. No Christian is perfect. We all have to realize that, and we have to learn how to help each other through our problems. Another reason that some young Christians are disappointed with their brethren, with other Christians, is they witness poor treatment among the brethren in Bible classes, or at work, or in business meetings, or in public, where harsh words can devastate the young in the faith. Well, what can we do? Number one, we need to set good examples. Timothy was told to be an example for the believers. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul told Timothy, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. We can help the new Christians realize that others are dealing with the same problems in their own lives. For example, the Apostle Paul himself was not perfect. He had to work on his imperfections. While writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he said, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Even the Apostle Paul had to constantly work at doing what was right. Young Christians may have disappointments in the world. The cares and responsibilities of life, such as jobs, families, hobbies, entertainments, often draw them away to the point of being unfaithful and unfruitful. In Luke 8, 14, as Jesus continues to explain the parable of the sower, what about the seed that fell among the thorns? Well, those are those who hear but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. The cares and responsibilities of life often draw the young Christian away. There's discouragement from old friends, peer pressure. Old friends who don't share in the love of the Lord. In Romans 1 verse 32 Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only uh, do them, these things that deserve death, but give approval to those that practice them. It's often very, very hard to set aside old friends and even unbelieving family members. Do not be deceived, Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. How can we help? What can we do? First of all, demonstrate what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that very thing. That means, seek first the Lord, and seek first His people. The Lord and His church must come first. 
We need to make it clear by our example that we are not in love with the world and the things of the world. Let's turn back to 1 John, this time chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him for all that is in the world. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. That means Christ comes first. It's up to us to develop friendship with the new Christians because they need our support. Our support as brothers and sisters in Christ and our support as friends. Let's read Galatians 2 and then skip to verse 10. Or Galatians 6, I should say. Verse 2. Then we'll skip to verse 10. Paul told the Galatian Christians, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. The new Christians will have disappointments in life. Many new Christians think all their problems are going to go away once they convert to Jesus Christ. Yet, there are problems that we all must expect. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. How can we encourage the new Christians concerning the disappointments in life? Well, We have to help them change the way they look at life. The trials of life will strengthen us, according to what we've just read in James chapter 1, and Peter agrees. In 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with the joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your soul. We can help the new Christian and encourage the new Christians by preparing them for adversity. In 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul told the young preacher, Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We see an example of that in the lives of the disciples in Acts 14, verses 21 through 22. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And of course, this is Paul on one of his missionary journeys, going city to city and strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and reminding them it will be many tribulations ahead to stay on the course in the kingdom of God. Christians seem to go in stages in their spiritual life. The ball of fire stage is characterized by great zeal following their conversion. To Christ. The reality stage is when the disappointments we discussed in this lesson seem to set in. Then comes the do or die stage, and that is where they move beyond disappointments, perhaps become complacent and apathetic, become the ones that are sometimes called the pew warmers, or even fall away. 
The steady-as-you-go stage is where growth is constant and progressive. In Proverbs 4, verse 18, Solomon, the wise man, wrote, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. For new Christians to reach this stage in life, for old Christians to maintain this stage in life, we must continue to grow steadily, and we must have realistic expectations. It's when our expectations are not realistic that we will become disappointed. Thank you for studying with me today. We certainly appreciate you staying to the end of the video, and we need to give some thank yous to first of all the Battle Creek Church of Christ for posting this outline on their website. I'll put a link to that in the description below and photo today that we use to show disappointment is from Monstera Production over at Pexels.com. Let's pray for one another and of course in a lesson like this, we need th those of us that have been Christians and are Christians for quite some time need to keep the new Christians at the top of our personal prayer lists. So we're praying for one another. We're praying for this world that we live in. We hope to be back with you in just a few days with another video. Until then, may God bless.